call this meeting to order at 7 p.m. Please rise for Pledge of Allegiance. Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome, everybody, to the Hampton Municipal Budget Committee meeting. It is Tuesday, September 19th. My name is Stephen LaBranch. I am the chairman. I would like the board to introduce themselves, starting on my left, which would be the viewer's right. Um, Ginny? Ginny Bridal Russell, Hampton School Board member. Sonny Kravitz. Brian Lapham. Regina Barnes, Board of Selectmen. Mike Clough, Vice Chairman. Danielle Augustine. Jones. David Morrow. Bob Ladd, Precinct Representative. Thank you. And we have Barbara Kravitz, our recorder, minutes recorder. So tonight, first thing on the agenda is the presentation and review of the school year by SAU 90. Um, Kathleen, please introduce yourself, and Nathan. Kathleen Murphy, Superintendent of Schools for SAU 90, Hampton School District. Nathan Lenning, Business Administrator at SAU 90. Welcome both. Thank you. Thank you. You have the floor. Thank you for having us. We always, Nathan and I, enjoy being here. Um, we enjoy sharing what hap what's happened uh, the past year and what we would anticipate to happen next year. So next year, so this is a wonderful opportunity to do that. If you can believe it, we're starting our seventh. We started our seventh year as a SAU 90, uh, July 1. Nathan and I came a little bit earlier in March of, of, of 10. 10, 11, 11, 11, 11. Yeah. <laughs> and so we've been a little bit longer than seven years, but as a district, seven years. And um, without a doubt, uh, it has been a, a very eventful seven years, and uh, we've had lots of accomplishments and uh, uh, challenges, but I think that uh, we both feel very strongly that we're in a community that has stepped up time and time again to support us to support the kids really and that's the primary purpose of our work is to ensure that the children of Hampton have an education that's second to none um, and I, I, I believe that uh, that to be the case uh, and as a district we continue to um, be a premier school district and often uh, admired by others and uh, I think that is a testament to our teachers to our administrators and to our uh, our families, really. So uh, tonight we get to spread a little of that joy with you, and uh, and so we hope we can uh, do that in a in a uh, a way that you'll appreciate. And we are more than open to questions from you uh, as we go through this tonight. So uh, you, yeah, I mean, basically we, we thought we'd follow similar format to what we have in the past. We want to take a few minutes and review with you. The year uh, passed, 2016-17. Uh, the fiscal year ended 3rd June of 17. Talk about some of the highlights uh, and, and uh, important facts from that year, some of our accomplishments and achievements. Uh, we'll talk about the year at hand, 17-18, uh, that was launched on the 1st of July, voted last March of 17, and then give you a sense of what may be coming um, in the budget development efforts for 1819, and because uh, we knocked down the you know, sixth grade wing of your middle school, we thought we'd give you you know just a quick update on, on what's happened with the Hampton Academy project, and then take any questions that you have. So, so Nathan and I will go back and forth, right? It's 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 I don't dare say it's like a marriage, but we can <laughs> finish each other's sentences now after seven years. So, um, that, you know, forgive us as we go back and forth, but we both know what we want to share tonight. So. First and foremost, one of the most important tasks we have in a district is around curriculum and instruction uh, for students. And so we continue that. As you know, the district had a, a plan for that. Uh, we've completed uh, mathematics, English language arts, and this summer uh, we finished science and social studies. So there's all curriculum up to date based on national standards. Um, and our teachers have been working on uh, performance assessments. That, that is that they take standards and they develop assessments to measure the student's performance. We did that all uh, this past year. Uh, and uh, we'll be moving on to other things, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, 
in terms of communication, we implemented a, a new uh, website in our district. Uh, you can go on to um, SAU90.org and you'll see our new website. Uh, we, we think it's a little, it's slick, it's a little bit easier to use, it's more friendly uh, to the user, and uh, but yet still provides the kinds of information that we need. We added a couple of new things. Uh, uh, we added Twitter and uh, your superintendent is tweeting. And, um, and it's a great way to get uh, the message out quickly uh, to folks. And then that's also picked up by Facebook. So that's what life is now. It's about social media and it's about our families uh, wanting information uh, quickly. And so we're using those tools uh, in order to get information to them about our school district. Um, we'll continue to use those for things like no school announcements and uh, meeting announcements and information that parents need. We also launched a new uh, <clears throat> parent information uh, messaging system, if you will. It's called School Messenger, so that we send home uh, information via uh, the electronically, so that parents get it via their um, their phones. They can at their their computers at home. And, and we still use uh, phone messages too, so. It's, it's an opportunity to say there's an app for that. There's, as a part of the school messenger implementation, our new website, all of those are integrated so that, for instance, teachers have a, a single login that allows them access to those tools that are in that messaging system as well as the website, but there's also an app coming uh, that, that families and the community will be able to use to, to gain access to all of that information more readily. Uh, and so, continue to take steps to try to use the technologies that are out there to, to make life easier and to make information more accessible for our, for our community and for our, for our stakeholders, the kids and the parents. Kids, are, uh, kids are, we finished with the, uh, the project around Chromebooks. Uh, all of our students, grades three through eight, all have a Chromebook. They use it just as they would a textbook or it's, it's a tool. It's a tool uh, for them to use to access primary documents, uh, research, uh, they apps, various apps. We use uh, mathematics apps where kids get to practice number facts. And so all of those things they use right on their Chromebooks. Uh, their stories are on Chromebooks uh, along with uh, activities. So they have become very proficient uh, in using those Chromebooks. We, Mr. The, Kravis was looking for the app, I think. Yeah, yeah I had a question. <laughs> you mentioned Twitter. I, I believe we have somebody in government that uses Twitter a lot. How are you going to control bullying? Well, I, I'm doing the tweeting, so <laughs> <laughs> I hope that you would not uh, put me in the same category. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, my <laughs> I don't I don't use I don't uh, put opinions out there. I put factual information, oh, not, not and it's not facts, fake news. Right? It's just information about our school district. So, uh, yeah, I'm I'm the one that's using it. So but the kids your first meeting. No, the kids the kids don't have tw they're not Twitter they're not using Twitter. <laughs> We do have issues. Um, we can talk about that. Well, I can talk about it now. Um, you know, kids learn the proper etiquette and the proper ways to use these tools, and it's our responsibility to teach them. Do some kids cross the line? Yeah, they do. And there are um, there are <clears throat> applications in place to protect them. Let me give you an example. We have this program, this app called Go Guardian. So if a youngster using our Chromebooks goes on to an inappropriate site that we don't think is acceptable, we get a message. Our technology director gets a message. Now we get messages on Saturday night, we could get one on Sunday afternoon, and uh, it tells us a message that the youngster is in, on an inappropriate site. Uh, the tech director calls the principal, <laughs> and the principal makes a call to the home and says, you might want to check on your son or your daughter because they're on an inappropriate site. So that's one way we kind of control that. The, we, we do have, we have had occasions for cyberbullying where they get on um, like uh, Snapchat, uh, Snapchat mm -hmm. and uh, they, um, they go back and forth with each other and there, can, there have been occasions where there is bullying. And usually that comes to our attention because it does affect the school climate, if you will, 
and it comes back to school and our principals uh, deal with it at, and in a way, a disciplinary way. So we try to manage it. Yeah, well, I'll just follow up and tell you, the Go Guardian tool is nice and quiet all day long while the students are resident in the building with the Children's Internet Portability, I mean, uh, Internet Protection Act, CIPA. We, 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 we conform to all of those requirements, and so inside the building, the filters are in place so that you can't get to an inappropriate site. But with a Chromebook application, kids can take them and go with them. And so when you're at home and you're on mom and dad's internet or what have you, or McDonald's or Donuts or something like that, uh, the, the, the device is more flexible. Uh, but GoGuardian is still resident and knows where you went, even though it can't stop you from going in, in some directions, like it can when you're inside the building. So, But overall, <clears throat> the computer use is... Uh, Very respectful. Yeah, I agree. Very respectful. Kids uh, use it in the, the way that it's supposed to be used. And um, we do, on occasion, have an issue, but for the most part, kids are great with it. So. I guess I'm a grown-up to Miss Hamming. Sometimes grown-ups make mistakes, I tell the kids. Sometimes grown-ups make mistakes, so I mean, that can happen, too. Um, you want to talk about food service? Hey, I can, I'll just tell you that in my financial review, we don't really splash much into that, but f food service finished 10000 to the black this year. <laughs> okay. uh, we appreciate the efforts of, of Mary Borg, our food service director, and her whole program. Uh, we, we are mindful that one bonus, if you will, was that... Um, uh, that she had been pro providing food service to uh, the Head Start program, 18 students that had, were, were in the building. And, and it was an additional revenue stream that uh, that helped because we were able to add a little surcharge there that you couldn't, I can't add in the normal course events. Uh, and uh, we won't be providing that service moving forward. So we see that revenue stream ending, but, uh, but we think we've found a way bringing some of the labor costs uh, down and being very mindful of our food costs, even as food costs grow. Um, and our participation levels have somewhat fallen off over the years. Uh, she seems to have found a balance. So 10,000 are the good, which is a whole lot better than we were five years ago. So. The participation costs of people eating? But the number of meals served, the number of kids that, um, the number of kids that actually, there have been, there have been over the last few years increasing regulations uh, that you would find manifested very simply in, for instance, the gray pasta uh, that we're making macaroni and cheese with as opposed to the, the very clear white pasta that we used to because now it has to have a, uh, a certain uh, whole grain uh, component. The pizza crust has changed, the, the protein and fat <laughs> contents and, 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 uh, and pr proportions have changed, and so it's been challenging, I think, for Mary to continue to get as many kids to come to the table um, as, as we used to have. Some of those programs have the potential to change over time. Uh, eggs are good, and then they're not, and then they are, and then they're not. So, you know, we'll, we'll see changes. We'll continue to see changes there in some of the regulations as well. But, uh, but she does her very best. I know she, that's the one joke that I always hear. It'd be great if it was white pasta again, because, boy, the kids just look at this, that gray stuff, and it's, you know, it doesn't, doesn't pull them in the same way as it used to. <laughs> It really is pretty gray. It, it doesn't, you know how pasta is usually white, it's going to have a little tinge to it. So the kids see it and they go, what is that? What you know, is that? Honey. One of the other things that Mary does and, and does well is we get commodities from the federal government. So we get fruits and vegetables and cheese and meats yep. that come to us to be used in, in our food service program. So that's another way she uses it very well in order to cre you know, create these, these um, menus every day for the kids. So um, it's a plus for us when she gets those um, commodities and um, can meld them into the kids' daily uh, lunches and breakfast too. So uh, that's been a plus for One us. One of the problems a lot of schools have is the government provides a lot of raw material, but they send it off for processing to save the labor costs of cooking. And they get back to trying. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, we, we do it. We do it. We do well. Mary does well in that program, uh, making, making, choosing recipes and making menus that use yeah. use what's coming. Uh, the commodities list comes out. Mary does does have some say in what she ends up with. Not not 
complete or comprehensive say, but there are some things that come, but she gets to pick and choose, so uh, she's also able to project a bit and, and anticipate what her, what her menuing wants to be, based on what she knows her, her kids want and will eat. And we're lucky that we have folks that will take um, the foods from scratch and make things for the kids. Yep. But there has been a, an increase, I would say, in those processed foods, you're right. Um, one of the things that we value, and I think I said that in my opening remark, was the value of our teaching staff. So that's really important to us. You know, they, they are what makes this work. And uh, so we, we, um, we value the professional development that we give them and the opportunities for them to learn outside the classroom and inside the classroom. One of the things that we noticed uh, last year was that there was a very limited pool of teachers looking to go into um, different levels of our business. For instance, principals, assistant principals, curriculum people. And the pool around the state was very small. And so we put our heads together. Uh, we we uh, met with uh, Southern New Hampshire University. And they are now uh, on site in Hampton with a cohort of 23 staff. They're not, on our, not all ours. Uh, we did this with Portsmouth and Rye. We came together, the three, the three towns. Um, and we have 23 uh, teachers in this pool that, is, um, that are um, focused on curriculum development and administration leadership. So we're kind of creating our own, if you will, farm team, you know, getting people ready to step up into leadership roles in the district so that um, we're not in the position where, you know, Seabrook struggled to find a principal um, to replace the middle school principal. You know, they had to go back out again. A number of districts have had to do that for a variety or, pr or put interims in there because they weren't able to find people to step into those roles. And so by creating this cohort in our district, um, we know that we will have um, some staff people who will be ready to step into those positions um, in terms of a succession plan. So we did that last year. It's been successful. They're about a year into their cohort and uh, they all seem to be doing quite well. So that's a way in which we can help our staff um, uh, stay on top of their, their, their skills, um, but also learn about uh, new things. So uh, that was a very successful program this year. Uh, grants, uh, we, we continue to monitor grants. We get grants for special education, uh, including preschool. We also get Title II, which is all around money for professional development. Um, we're a little concerned about that one coming because um, in the new budget uh, that the President put forth, uh, they've eliminated Title II, which is all our professional development money. So uh, the Board is going to need to address that over the next year. Uh, we also get money for our um, ELL kids. Those are our English language learners, and I'm going to talk a little bit about those in a minute, but we get money for that. We also get money for um, our homeless uh, population that allows us to uh, help defray the costs of transportation and any other kinds of costs that might be associated with that. Um, we also get money from Title I, which is money for youngsters that we focus in Hampton on English language arts and math um, for uh, youngsters that are, that are um, challenged by those subject matters, but don't have an IEP, that aren't special ed, but is not quite up to be where they need to be, so we give them additional support using Title I money. Um, and it's based on, on low income poverty levels in the community, so we get a grant every year for that. I think that about covers it. I'll talk about some others later. Hey, it's over the course of this last year, I'm sure that uh, I'm sure that you caught the news. Uh, Kathleen was awarded, uh, recognized this last year or this last summer as a New Hampshire Superintendent of the Year. Uh, I I can let her talk more about the experience and some of the things that she's done. But it was a pleasure to it was a pleasure to man the technology at the uh, Commissioner's Conference uh, School Administrators this summer and the end of June. Uh, she was the keynote speaker. Uh, one beautiful morning uh, and put together a presentation that uh, spoke very much uh, to the, the school leaders from systems all across the state. Uh, and, uh, and so we're awfully, awfully proud to have seen lots of achievements and recognitions in this, 
in this school district over the last handful of years, but uh, this one was a was another special one this last year. It doesn't happen without a really good team around you. Just know that you can't do it alone, and it really is about the the village. You know, the the folks in the village, and the teachers, and the administrators, and the just doesn't happen it really doesn't so and the school volunteers uh, Marston and Center schools uh, uh, have seen uh, recognition for the volunteer uh, support that they get from the parents and community members uh, in the programs that uh, that surround our instruction in those schools uh, you know it's worth it's worth making sure that we continue to, to scream loudly the thanks for all of the support uh, certainly the the support that we see when it comes time to go to the to the to the voting booth but uh, our PTA contributes uh, contributes significantly through the fundraising that it does to all three of our schools every year and again this year huge donations from the PTA in support of enrichment programs uh, we we recognize a private donation from the Merrill family the other night at the school board meeting ten thousand dollars in support of the Hampton Academy project uh, we have secured uh, uh, excited team uh, worked through the application process competitively and secured a fifty thousand dollar grant from the department of education uh, that will uh, begin to see some implementation over the course of this coming year the grant is focused on our district we were one of six uh, districts in the state to be chosen for this fifty thousand dollar grant and it will be um, focused on having a trauma-informed school district and what does that mean that means that we know that when students, especially young children, are faced with trauma, whether it's, uh, whether it's um, lack of uh, food and nutrition, whether it's uh, some situations around abuse, uh, whatever that trauma looks like, it, or it could be a death in the family, it could be um, a passing of grandparents. Um, often leaves children um, impacted and so uh, this grant will allow us to work uh, with our teachers uh, to better understand the impact of trauma and what it means to, to children in terms of their learning and by not addressing it you know you sort of the kids uh, don't get that attention that they need and, and don't have the therapy that they need to to deal with some of the issues so this grant will allow us to do that so we're pretty pretty um, excited about uh, the opportunity and so we've talked about that which has gone on in the 2016-17 school year let me brief you on the business uh, affairs of that year the general fund uh, operating budget finished with an operational savings of just over three hundred eighty thousand uh, dollars there's a there's a more detailed uh, document if you will on page eight <coughs> of your packet question sir does that mean money is saved uh, what you were allowed to spend you, right it was the the surplus of uh, the surplus unspent the unspent budget unspent appropriations yeah. 380,000 uh, let me just highlight a couple of things first based on enrollment uh, there were seven kindergarten classrooms uh, budgeted in that year ultimately we only employed teachers in six classrooms and reduced because of the smaller number of kindergarten students who showed up for school that uh, added to uh, that created a savings of a full teaching position that was vacant as well as a uh, 18 19,000 dollar paraprofessional kindergarten assistant position that would have been in that classroom in addition we had four retirees veterans top of the scale uh, and, and generated some savings uh, in in hiring to replace them and so you'll see uh, the first line of that report regular education there was a savings of almost 150,000 uh, that washes away quickly in special education because we had, we budget for known population. The, we have not we have not put a lot in terms of well we haven't really put much of anything in terms of contingency when it comes to uh, budgeting for special ed. Somewhere else in the report, I'll tell you uh, we've got two hundred and thirty thousand dollars in the special education trust fund, and as a result, we don't we don't cushion for special ed. We budget for the population we have, the uh, individual, educa individual education plans that they have, and the, the services that they should receive. Uh, but it doesn't take much when even a single student moves in with a, uh, a, an 
expensive list of needs uh, and out of district placements in some cases because we can't provide for those students best in the schools and they end up somewhere else and in this case you can see that our budget was almost two hundred thousand dollars over in that area and it was really driven by out of district tuitions that were unforeseen when we drafted the 1617 budget uh, other notes I would suggest to you that uh, uh, there were some dollars that left over in what we call related related services. That was because in a couple of cases, students who were expected to receive services in-house ended up in out-of-district placement, and so we didn't spend those dollars. Uh, there are There's a, a negative uh, at the end of the technology division. Uh, we advanced our fiber uh, initiative and brought um, fiber optics into all three buildings. We connected the three buildings with fiber in town and then we are connected from the Hampton Academy through the filtered protected uh, internet connection to the, the great wide web uh, that was a project that was 50% reimbursed by e-rate except uncle hasn't yet handed us our <laughs> reimbursement so I'm in the negative there because I haven't yet seen that and I'm not going to see it fast enough to book that as a receivable so that'll be That'll be an expected revenue that you'll have in the coming year. Uh, thankfully, the bottom line supported it, and so we had moved knowing that we were going to get half of it back from Uncle. We just haven't seen it yet. Uh, in the area of buildings, uh, we had some savings in energy, and we had said that as we marched into the budget process, uh, both electricity and natural gas for our heating. We did well. That number was boosted a bit as well because we had encumbered some dollars that ultimately couldn't be used and were refunded back against that line here at the end of the year. We had talked about a Safe Routes to School project out uh, in front of Center School on Winnicunnet Road, and those dollars went unspent, and so they're coming back to you here, uh, return to the taxpayers. In the area of uh, benefits, we saw uh, a lower than proposed or lower than we budgeted for health rate, uh, and we also, because of the savings on salaries that you saw, didn't spend as much as had been anticipated in the area of payroll taxes and New Hampshire retirement contributions. All of that adds up to a balance of 380000 on the spending side. The next piece would be to tell you that our excess revenues totaled about $60,000. If you look at the next page, which is page 9 in your packet, I, I try to put the notes. I, we do that monthly with the school board so that they can, you know, uh, there's nothing worse than answering the question correctly three times or four times and then scratching my head the fifth time because I don't remember what, what that answer was because it was so long ago. So I just started putting notes out there. I did it for Jerry. Let's be honest. Yeah. Jerry had asked me the question again and I said, Jerry, I don't remember now. So I put the notes out there. That's my Jerry column. And now it just made sense to all of the board. Everybody liked being able to see that. So you can see in the notes here as well. Uh, the, some of the pluses and minuses. The areas that have dollars are those that are uh, connected to or related to the, the excess revenues. So remember, as we approach tax rate setting this time of year, we anticipate what revenues we think we will, uh, we will derive or generate outside of taxes. You take that off the bill and the rest is what we raise in taxes. So if I thought that I was going to raise $500 in tuition revenue and I earned $800, that extra $300 gets returned because had I guessed better and had $800, you wouldn't have raised $300 extra in taxes. So that's why excess revenues or unanticipated revenues are so important to us uh, because it uh, goes back to that commitment to the taxpayers. So you have $60,000 here, the biggest portion of which is uh, regular tuition of 14 and change, uh, catastrophic aid that that the state is famous for underfunding that came in higher than expected by 16000 and Medicaid to schools reimbursement from uncle uh, that added up to 32000 beyond what was anticipated. If I combine the two, the operational savings in the budget and the excess revenues beyond what was anticipated, fund balance to offset taxes, these tax bills that we're anticipating in the next couple of months, uh, that fund balance offset will be $443. Excuse me, 443 bucks, and the rest of us, no, $443,000. Uh, that's the general fund. Uh, on the federal fund side, we talked uh, about Title I and II and IDEA, $521,000 to the benefit of, uh, of uh, programs here in the Hampton Schools. I mentioned food service, finishing with a little better than $10,000 uh, to the positive, and your trust fund, 
uh, about two hundred thirty thousand. So that's the that's the financial recap for sixteen seventeen. So before we talk about current year seventeen eighteen, any like maybe it's good. Any questions about that year? Okay. We have a question from the beginning. When Kathleen mentioned about <coughs> the second to none in, in Hampton. Yeah, I think I'm second to none. I want to be second. Would we stand in the state in reference to our level of student achievement in reference to scores of math well, and English? Yeah, we they used to rank the schools. They used to put us all in a ranking order. Um, Hampton always was in the top ten. They don't rank anymore, so um, I don't have a way to judge that. So nobody really knows. Right. Except that I know that when we get our test results back, like next uh, in October, I'll be reporting to the board um, that I, I look at what the state did as on average, and you know there's highs and lows there, so you get an average score. And how do we compare to that average score, the state score? And in every single case, in every area in grade level, we score significantly better than the state average. So, you know, so you I have the results from last year. The same thing last year. We we our our students' performance um, uh, ranked better than state average, uh, but we don't know how did we rank against another district. It's a little tough to do that. For let me give you an example. Um, Hampton has about a twenty percent um, low income of youngsters in our school. One out of five, okay, are in that that low income range. Uh, we also have a pretty significant um, population of homeless students who are in transition, and and they that's those are challenges. So when you think about it, you can't always compare yourself to another town that has an inc maybe a low income, a poverty level of five percent. Do you know Do you know what I'm saying? Because the opportunities that those kids have. Um, perhaps will be greater than the opportunities that some of our kids had. So it's difficult to do that. Um, but when I when I make comments like that, I having been around the state and having spent time across the state, and knowing that the recognition that the that for instance Center School was selected as a national blue ribbon school of excellence, based on their performance, based on their performance alone, they were selected. Um, you know, Marston has been recognized for the work that they did in low-income kids and, and raising the level of performance for those kids in Title I. They went to the National, uh, National Conference and represented Marston School because of the work they did. Uh, same with uh, um, uh, the sc their school, of Marston's a school of excellence, by judged by a panel of their peers as well as other folks from all over the state who come in and evaluate the school. Um, and obviously led by their principal, Dr. Costa, who is also a... So, you know, you have to kind of use those things. Uh, the work that we've done, uh, they've asked us to participate in presentations uh, because of our work that our teachers have done here. Uh, the Department of Ed has asked us in the past to participate and present at workshops. Um, we have uh, a teacher this year, a computer teacher, uh, Mrs. Levine, who will be presenting at a statewide workshop uh, next month. So it's that kind of thing, David, that um, I'm, I'm, maybe it can, can be considered soft, a little soft, because I don't have hard numbers. But based on a, a lot of that data, um, I, I feel that our school district is, is easily uh, in the top 10. Top 10 on how many? Um, <coughs> it depends. Well, 100, about 185, yeah. uh, 89 I'm elementary looking schools. Looking for rough, I'm not yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. I, I forget the numbers. The top now. ten out of 180 yeah. districts or whatever so, schools would be outstanding. Yeah, they're doing very well. I think um, you're understating it then. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, 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 I. Thank you, Nathan. I wanted to uh, highlight this. Uh, fiber optics. All three schools are connected to the fiber optics. It's operational presently. Yes. And you're connected to some service provider who is? We connected, uh, uh, it was through, uh, they just got acquired, it was Bay Ring off uh, Pees, now they're owned by uh, Oxford, now owned by That's not First Comcast. Not, 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 not for, okay. So we have, uh, 
boy, I wouldn't. I don't want to mix up dark fiber and light fiber. We we lit fiber. There's fiber. We have a we have a fiber line from Marston to the academy and from Center to the academy, and then there's fiber service from the academy going out to the the, the competitive. Right. And, are, these, like. are these lines uh, above or below ground? They're above. And they're above. Uh, both of them. The Marston line is above uh, until it hits our property, and then it's under because all of our service goes in under. Uh, centers above. I don't remember the academy where that was placed. Okay. And we own. It will eventually be under. <laughs> yeah. We own. We do not lease. No, we're. No, we're leasing that. We're leasing that fiber between the th the, the three points. Uh, I thought the strategy was own. It. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, the uh, the. A bigger a bigger project, greater capital expense licensing on the poles so in this case uh, as we wait to see what the what the state does and what this community might do with fiber um, we have a I think it's a five if I remember it's a five year a five year lease that connects the three buildings right now we'll talk offline yeah okay thank you thank you and anything else about this past year that we can address uh, uh, I see common enrollments at 1,081. Is that an increase, decrease? And the other question I have is, uh, the, the parochial school has, what, about 40 students from Hampton. And any idea of the number of homeschool kids in town? Yeah, I can answer that. We have 1,088 students as of today. I checked their enrollment. Uh, that was as of today. We've grown. Uh, that is a down from last year by about, uh, what did I say? 20. About 20. We're down 20. You know what um, the trend is over the last five or 10 years? We've, we've actually um, decreased um, probably around 100 over the last five years. Um, the major impact has been at the primary grade level. Uh, you heard Nathan talk about a decrease in our kindergarten. Um, that's where the, the change in our enrollment has been significantly at that level. And yet when they move on, our numbers at Marston have stayed flat and Hampton Academy is 420. I mean, that's, that's where they've been since I've been here. So we believe, and the, at least what we're told, is that... Um, it's challenging for a young family to buy homes in Hampton at the price that is on the market, right? And uh, so what we're experiencing is more mature families. So the children are a little bit older. The families are more established work-wise and can afford the homes. And so that's what, we've, well, that's what we're seeing. Um, I think that's um, why we've experienced that. Um, next question was um, how many at Sacred Heart? The how many at Sacred Heart? We have um, Sacred Heart. Last number we saw today was 145. There are about 40 students of Hampton youngsters at yeah. Sacred Heart. Um, you know we do um, support them with uh, Title II money, and they get a little Title II money. They also get a little special education money, um, and uh, obviously your the grant that they yeah. that gets voted in every year. School, we Homeschool is really gone. It's not a very well. It's very difficult to give you a number, and I'll, let me explain why. Um, a a family decides to homeschool their youngsters. Uh, they write a letter to me to the superintendent, t explaining to me that they're going to homeschool. They tell me who they're homeschooling, what the age is, and that's the last I hear of from them. So, I don't know what happens to them. Uh, they're obviously homeschooled their first year, but after that, they could move out of town. They could, you know, we just don't know. Um, we do know that we have, as of today, I checked again that number this morning before I knew, knowing I was coming here. We have some homeschool students who are now accessing programs at our schools. So, say a mom and dad say, "Gee, I really don't want to do pre-algebra at or algebra." Could could they they come to Hampton Academy and they'll take that class? Uh, we have so we have some students at um, Hampton Academy and at Marston accessing programs. And, you know, they're taxpayers. You know, they have every right to it, um, and it's a very uh, easy 
they come in, they, they work, meet with the principal, uh, they work on the schedule when those classes are, and the family's parents bring them in, and they seem to do fine. So, How many um, of those are there, any idea? In, in the common access programs right now, we have six. Just six. Yeah, just six. Thank you. Does that answer you? Is it you good with that? So, 17, 18, the current year. <clears throat> so you, you're, you're really familiar with these. Um, number one goal for this year, and the board has adopted these, by the way. This is These, these were adopted by our school board in June uh, uh, to work uh, for 100% proficiency in our core subject areas, math, science, social studies, and English language arts. We continue to do that. We want all children to be successful, and we provide the supports necessary to help them reach their potential. Um, I talked about human capital, and that's our teachers and our resources and our paraprofessionals, but it goes much beyond that. I mean, our custodial staff is awesome, and our buildings are well kept. Our secretarial, our administrative assistants, they've just um, been a, a real um, support. I, I, I think the, 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 the resources, the people resources in our district are really devoted to the work here in Hampton. Communication will continue to work to uh, communicate with our families and with the community. Tonight's a great example of how we can communicate what's going on in the schools. And last, uh, oh, and then governance, which is really around our school board. Uh, they uh, are, are busy this year. They'll be continuing to address um, critical concerns, and they work on policy, budget, um, and so we keep them pretty busy uh, with work. And then lastly, the um, finance, which is in Nathan's bailiwick and facility, which we really want to talk a little bit about what's happening over at Hampton Academy. And we I'd like to that. ask a question on number one, please. I'm kind of on the same track I was before. You say you want to continue to proficiency, which I think is wonderful. Where are we now, and how do you measure that? Right. Well, we use a national, we use a state assessment to do that. Okay. We we we've been using Smarter Balance Assessment. Um, which is a state-adopted assessment for all the kids. They take it online. They use their, their Chromebooks to take the exam. But here's an example. We know that this past year, 85% of our third, at the end of third grade, 85% of the kids were either proficient or proficient with distinction in English language arts. Okay? We're not there at 100%, right? The principal has analyzed what is it that we need to do for those 15% that haven't reached proficiency. Um, we've identified them. Um, we also try to see, we try to um, analyze, have they been with us? Have they experienced the Hampton curriculum? Um, have they been with us uh, all those four years, kindergarten through uh, grade three? We also know that about 15% of our kids have never had a preschool experience. So there's things, there's gaps that we need to, um, to focus on in order to reach that 100%. Um, if I went down through the grade levels, uh, we probably are in somewhere around uh, the 75 uh, to 80 percent uh, proficiency or proficiency. So would that be above state average? No, state average is at least uh, 10 or 15 points lower than that. Well, you said that would be above state average. That would be above state average, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, stay tuned uh, uh, next uh, board meeting on October. They have that presentation with all the test results. So Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll be delivering that message to them. But it's a great question. And, you know, some people say, you know, will you ever reach 100%? And I've, I'm asked that question a lot because, you know, there is a reality, you know, that some children struggle with, um, with learning. But I would never, and our teachers would never, say, well, that one can't reach their potential, or they can't, you know what I mean? So you always set the bar high, right? If you're a high jumper, you always keep moving that bar up, right? So you work to achieve that high bar with high expectations, and that's what, that's what we've tried to implement here in the district. What uh, were your percentages a couple of years ago? Um, well, you know, we've changed assessments, so it's been hard to, 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 and when you change to a new assessment, you'll see a dip in the scores because the kids, so we saw a little bit of a decline, um, but um, the last few years we've seen an increase in the scores. And we, we kind of follow the cohort. We don't just do all the third graders every year because it's a different group of kids. So what we 
demonstrate with the board is how did the third grade is doing third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade. And so we can follow that. Um, probably the one area that we've um, struggled the most with is mathematics. Although our scores are above state average, they're not where we want to be. And so we've um, both uh, at Marston and at Hampton Academy this past year have implemented new materials. New it's material? New math materials with the kids. Well, do they have, I assume you probably have after school programs if, if kids wanted to go to extra help in certain subjects such right. as math. Um, both at Marston um, and at Hampton Academy we have after school programs where the kids can stay after school and get extra help. And the board has authorized late buses. So um, we have a 4 o'clock run at Marston and a 4 o'clock run at Hampton Academy so those kids can still stay after school and, but still get home. So I didn't know that's that. helped. That's good stuff. Yep. Thank you. I know some trees will cut down across <laughs> from the academy. <laughs> yeah. And that had nothing to do with the building project. This building, the, the project, there's a lot of noise there. <laughs> Is it on uh, any problems surface yet? We're, yeah, How are you going to talk about? Yeah, it? we're going to talk about that okay. uh, as much as you guys can tolerate. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, before that, I mean that I can tell you, the operating budget you're looking at this year, it's twenty million nine seventy five, including your three hundred thousand dollar warrant uh, that you're familiar with for long term maintenance, uh, which has of the last couple of cycles has gone into roofing at Marston School predominantly. Um, 220,000, I think, or so of that 300 each of the last two years. Uh, so, we kicked off a great start to 2017-18. Superintendent's already mentioned we opened with 1,088 students, uh, five uh, five new teachers, two new paraprofessionals, and two district-wide staff members uh, joined the team. We had a we it's had a paraprofessional. Paraprofessional. A paraprofessional is a. You would call them an ed tech or a teacher aide, a teacher assistant. Uh, we have a couple of classifications, if you will. We have those who are uh, very much working with students under the supervision of teachers in the classroom. Uh, we call those uh, associates or aides. We also have monitors, and that would be your your crossing guard and your lunchroom, your lunchroom monitor, et cetera. Um, another unionized force, for, by the way. Uh, our teachers are members of the Seacoast Education Association and our paraprofessionals all belong to the Seacoast Educational Support Professionals uh, uh, Personnel Association. So they assist the teacher with certain aspects yeah, absolutely. of education. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so the teachers, uh, the teachers had a, a multi-day orientation uh, that kicked off uh, in the days that uh, before they were joined with joined by all of the teaching force and then had three more days of, uh, of opening exercises, uh, time to set up classrooms and uh, professional development uh, collectively and in their buildings. Uh, the two new district-wide resources that I mentioned, uh, behavior specialist and the nurse assistant, uh, an LPN, licensed practical nurse. We talked about that in the budget cycle last year. The, the behavior specialist was really a reclassification of contracts that we were farming out now bringing in our own behaviorist who can work with other members of the team and provide a greater amount of service uh, at, uh, at less cost ultimately. Uh, and then the nurse assistant, uh, an idea that is continuing to evolve, the idea that we just have a growing number of medical needs, uh, whether they are uh, um, um, di di diabetes, uh, allergies, uh, other medical uh, frailty, uh, you know, needing attention, monitoring, uh, assistance, personal service, enough so that when you add all of this together with the normal bureaucracy and, and, and service to kids that our nurses have to do, all of the paperwork and, and medicines and everything has to be very much documented and maintained, the nurses really could use some assistance. And so we thought we would move forward with an LPN, the idea being eventually, like so many other models, I don't want to hire a whole bunch of RNs, as much as that might be nice, that's much more expensive. LPN is, is a fraction of the cost, but can provide lots of the services as they work with the RNs in our building. Uh, and so, ultimately, we have a, a health aid position, which is really like an, an LNA or a CNA, a nursing assistant, uh, um, who we, we think we would like to turn into 
another LPN, and ultimately we'd like to have each of the RNs paired with an LPN in the buildings. Those LPNs are running in the, uh, our budget for this one was $27,000 uh, in wages for the school year. So uh, you'll see us talk more about that in the budget process. It was a, it was a busy summer. So without, got, without talking too much about the project, first the SAU office had to move because second, the sixth grade had to move and they moved to Marston, uh, including our space because what followed was tearing down of the sixth grade wing. And there were a whole number of classroom moves in the middle uh, to make room for that uh, all to happen. So it was a busy summer. And we uh, take every opportunity to say thank you to our internal facility staff, our custodial team, Mr. Lassard and his whole team, because they orchestrate all of the moves while they're also stripping and refinishing all those floors in all of those classrooms in all three buildings, uh, in addition to uh, putting a wipe and really washing, cleaning all of the surfaces, walls and the, and the like throughout the schools to make sure that we open back up uh, with a, a clean and safe learning environment for our staff and our students. So a very busy, very busy summer. Continuing to talk about some right. of the things that are impacting I, us. I think the, we wanted to try to give you a little bit of an idea about some things that um, you'll hear about when we come in to do the budget. Uh, some things that have um, we've experienced over the last uh, 24 months that have um, affected uh, the work that we do and uh, we are experiencing uh, an increase in um, youngsters that require special education services. Uh, we have we are now up to 161 students that require uh, some special education, some support. I, uh, we, we outlined what those supports would be. We have um, speech and language, occupational therapy, physical therapy, counseling, vision, and auditory services. Uh, so those are all required as part of an individual education plan. And as you know, that plan is developed with staff and parents. Uh, so given the increased uh, services, uh, the board actually this past year authorized an additional uh, teacher to work with youngsters uh, with uh, special needs. The other thing that has uh, changed significantly for us, you asked the question what's different over the last few years. You know, three years ago I think we had zero students placed out of district. Those are students that we were unable, you know, that would be a student that we were unable to provide services for. That number is now six. Mm -hmm. Um, we have five that we have been involved in and one that's court ordered. Um, and so that um, has placed a pretty significant burden on the budget. And um, so we just kind of want to give you a heads up. You'll see that in the budget when we present this year um, because we have responsibility for them. And in addition to the out of district placement, it still requires that our staff participate in the planning and the implementation and the work that's done in that out of district placement. So our um, director for um, pupil personnel services, uh, Jessica Parsons, is expected to uh, to um, visit the schools where the youngsters are placed. So they'll have their own mini budget for that group of six, correct? Say that again? They'll have their own mini budget. Well, it is a mini budget. I mean, right. it's, yeah, you'll see that in the budget. It's in um, in some budget with it. Yeah, in the in the tuition accounts. And I don't want to fear monger, but it's worth yeah. saying, we have great resources in house. So those when we had zero. So to say now that we have six, they are they are expensive out of district placements. These are not students whose needs are minor. We serve a, a wealth of student needs inside the district with the staff and the resources that we have. And so, again, not wanting to fearmonger, but these can these are 120,000, 175,000 a year in per tuition, student. per student, in tuition. And then in many, most, most cases actually, there's transportation, special transportation to get to and from on, say, a daily basis. Um, uh, residential placements sometimes occur, and those can be more expensive. So it, it's been a challenge because just those half dozen uh, aren't, that's not a small budget impact, that's a major budget impact, and not all of it was anticipated, as you saw, a $200,000 override in that overrun, in that one line, or that one area of the budget this last cycle. Uh, we, we know that we're going to see some challenges against the budget again this year, because we have more identified students in placements than we had budgeted for, because they weren't here then, so 
there's uh, it's that's why it's nice to have we didn't you know we didn't uh, there was no need to, to to cry help you know SOS May Day because you still have the 230,000 in the trust fund and this budget supported it and and likely will again this year I, we're not saying that it's that it's uh, a crisis but but when we come back knowing who those students are and what those needs are you'll see budget requests that match what those programs cost so thank you we also provide services to charter schools if a youngster opts to go to a charter school as you know is a public school um, that youngster is uh, uh, has uh, in individual needs uh, learning needs then we have a responsibility uh, to provide that service uh, to that youngster so right now we have I thought we had two. Yeah, we're, I, we're at two right now at charter schools um, that are receiving services from us. And, and what we do there is we use one of our existing staff members to travel to that site, provide the service, and then return to our site. So it's much more uh, cost effective if we do it like that than actually outright paying for that to a charter school. So where are the charter schools? Um, there's uh, Dover, um, Exeter. Um, That's as far as we go right yeah, now. Yeah, Dover and Exeter are the two places that we use. So at least it's not a great distance um, for uh, for us. The other area that I thought would be interesting to you is, and I put it, in, it's in your packet. You'll have a map uh, in your packet, and uh, one of the one of the areas that we've seen is the change of demographics in Hampton. Is a significant? We're starting to see a significant change in the demographics of our student population in Hampton, and this just gives you an idea. These are students uh, that require uh, support in learning uh, English with English language learners ELL. Um, you'll the sometimes are all from these other countries. Yeah, that's their origin. Uh, the uh, origin, and I we list it all. And then I thought the map was kind of interesting to show you where all of our youngsters are coming from. Now we have other youngsters in our district that don't require English language services. That are you know um, Asian kids, um, uh, Latino youngsters. Uh, we have. Uh, a variety of uh, African American youngsters, those all of those categories have increased uh, this year. And so we're seeing a little bit more of change in our demographics and uh, diversity in our classrooms, which is which is healthy, which is very healthy. Have you identified any of the student bodies that's at risk under the dreamers? You know, with the parents who are um, not citizens? Right, we don't. Uh, we we uh, when they register to us, um, they are required to show a birth certificate, um, but we're not in the business. Uh, we That becomes more of a, a, a police government matter. Um, but to our knowledge, our kids are all um, citizens of the United States. Um, Good. The, the United States... <laughs> <laughs> it should be treated that way. Um, the, 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 the two um, red dots in the United States just simply means that uh, they were born here, but uh, their families uh, are not still not speaking uh, English, and so the youngsters are not speaking English yet. Here's, the, here's, here's what I love about this. We have every year, we have to test these youngsters too, and we have annual measurable objectives, and these kids have to meet these annual objectives, okay, that are established by the Department of Ed, and our teachers work with the kids, and then they take a test at the end of the year. And we have had a history of all of our kids meeting their measurable objectives at the end of the year. We have two wonderful teachers, but the piece that's really um, extraordinary for me and it's wonderful to observe these kids are right in the classroom with everybody else they're immersed into our language and uh, into our culture and into our just our routines of of um, of school and they pick up the language very quickly they often pick up the language very well the vocabulary some of the areas that they need extra help in is the comprehension they know the word <laughs> but what does it mean 
So we have to spend a little bit more time with them on the comprehension piece and they'll stay with us a little bit longer. But we only have a few students at Hampton Academy. Most of these youngsters are either at Center or Marston and by the time they leave Marston, uh, they, they're, they're in good places. The, we have two at um, Hampton Academy this year only because they just moved into the district and they're brand new, so. They will be assimilated. <laughs> they will be. They will be, and they very and they learn it very quickly. So, so each of these red dro dots represent one student, or uh, we numbers? have thirty. I didn't say that. Thank you. We have thirty-four youngsters in the program. Mm -hmm. So they just represent a location from which one of them all come from. Okay. Right. It could be, you know, brother and sister too. You sure. know. So. And don't forget the other half of that is communicating with the parents who don't speak English. That's what I was just going to ask. This is the yeah, so we do you do anything for the parents? Yeah, we have folks that can. We have some teachers who can speak the language, um, and then we also have resources through the Department of Ed that we can get somebody in to translate. So we do. Uh, we have to do that sometimes at our meetings so that we can have effective communication quickly the kids pick up sometimes you'll you'll have the youngsters right at the meetings and they'll help with the um, the translation of the language to, to moms and dads so it, it it it's it's really it's really great to see um, well to give you an example of a kindergarten class that we have operating this year there's one kindergarten class with four English as a second language students two special needs students two homeless children and six regular students and that teacher and aide is working with all those kids and making a true community but it's not an easy task when they go home it's changing the it is changing. changing so you want to jump into next sure. year you want to go to next year sure <laughs> so 18 19 we'll be back in december we uh, we assume uh, budget books, uh, when the board has done its deliberation and finalized the budget, we uh, uh, haven't spoken to the chair yet, but the plan would be to make sure we got those out before Thanksgiving, because we know that over Turkey, that's what everybody wants to do, is <laughs> rifle through that book. Um, so, things that we're continuing to do. Um, we continue to look at all of the relevant data that we have in terms of focusing on our human capital needs, staffing. Uh, came right out, you know, talked right off the bat with the financials from 1617 and said the enrollment didn't direct that we have seven classrooms at the kindergarten, we had six. That freed up an aid and a teaching position. Uh, we continue to be mindful of that as we contemplate the budget. What are the staffing needs? What are the enrollment projections? Uh, what student levels do we have? We do the same thing with IEPs and look at tuitions and look at uh, special ed staffing, etc. I know that in the area of curriculum, the superintendent continues to advance uh, a, a review cycle. You've got world language, mm -hmm. world language coming up, reviewing that. Uh, it, it means uh, contemplating current practice, standards, what resources could be and should be uh, made available to advance uh, that, uh, you know, that area, uh, and then working towards implementation of curriculum changes uh, that need to be made with it. Yep. Please, yeah. Um, the the second one on your sheet is uh, we are looking at um, procuring a evidence based uh, program to address uh, drug and alcohol issues. Um, we don't have a sustained, consistent program across all grade levels, K through eight. And so um, I have um, commissioned, if you will, a group of staff. Uh, to work with me this year to um, to look and decide on a uh, program because we need to do that. Um, the kids, they're faced with these issues um, and you know that we've had a number of deaths in Hampton and, um, and it has affected our families and our children who have lost family members and um, we feel that the best way to help combat this is through a good, strong, solid education program. So that's a big deal for us next year. Do you already have that in the high school? Um, in the high school they do. And we have a health class in middle school, you know, and they do it. They, they And the teachers do it, but it's not, you know, you want to have a program that's sustained, that's the messages all the way through, and it's developmentally appropriate too, because you don't do the same thing with an eighth grader that you did with a kindergarten youngster, you know. But um, you do talk about 
um, things based on their developmental age. The high school does. Thank you. Also. Do you have NARCON in the nurses station? Uh, uh, the board uh, was faced with that question last year um, and under uh, advice from our uh, fire department and our emergency, uh, the head of emergency and uh, Nate Denio uh, met with the board, uh, had a great discussion with the board and the school nurses because they were involved in the discussion and uh, Nate recommended that they we not have that in our in our buildings. Um, and the reason for that is, is the effects of Narcan on the individual who receives it. And because the police and the fire are so close to us, that in the time that it would take a nurse to determine what the issue was and to administer, they could be there. And one of the concerns Nate had was that there's often violent behavior when that drug is administered. And that puts our school nurses in a precarious situation. So they feel that when, when Nate comes on scene, they often don't give the full dose. They'll give smaller doses depending on the situation and they make that judgment. Uh, so advise not, do we not have it? Um, all the police cars have it as well as the fire department. The police do? They did. My understanding is they do. That's nice to me. It, you know what? You read so much about it. I'm, I'm, yeah. Maybe they haven't done that in Hampton. They have done it in other towns, in other yeah. cities. Other cities, they put it I in I think schools. Nate's concern is um, it, is that it puts everybody in jeopardy to deal with the the fallout of administering the medication. When the kids matriculate up to the high school and they meet kids from the other community, how do they do in reference to the, you know, the testing against the kids from other communities? Well, again, I we look at their report cards, you know, we look at the, they, we, um, the principal sends us their report cards and David and I look at them and see what, how they did. Uh, you know, last year, uh, they were the top 10 graduates at Winnicunit. Seven of them were Hampton students, so you got to think that maybe they they they're you know they're handling themselves well at the high school. Um, you know, I attend a graduation, and uh, graduation rates are very good. Uh, kids are leaving high school either to go on to college or to a private to a, uh, community college or military or jobs. So. Um, I don't have the breakout of their state assessment by district. I don't have that. As we march towards uh, the pr proposed 1819, <clears throat> we are budgeting for the final, fourth and final year of our paraprofessional CESPA collective bargaining agreement. So we'll be in negotiations with them next fall of 18. Uh, we're budgeting for the third of four years of our teacher agreement. With, uh, with C. Uh, we expect health insurance premiums will rise, but we also feel that we've been very fortunate and have been very successful with our wellness programming, so we're hopeful uh, that that won't be uh, as great as it might otherwise. Remember that for the current year, 17-18, we were uh, guaranteed a maximum rate increase of 1.7% and realized a decrease of 4.6%. Uh, Knock on wood, we'd like to see that trend continue, but we know we know that in that year we were the lowest in the July pool with Health Trust and those Anthem plans, and we hope that that will continue. And I've talked to you about special ed costs, so we'll see some increases there. The superintendent has mentioned that we're continuing to be attentive to our entitlement grants. Uh, Title II has had a, a, a significant cut, and there's none as we move forward potentially, so we talk about how we can deal with those lost professional development dollars, and then we pay attention to the others as well. I don't want to get into too much detail on that question, but we're talking about the the wage increases. And I've been talking to people in Massachusetts who are in school systems, whatever, <clears throat> and their system has, depending on the number of years, you get an automatic increase. Some of them are union schools. Are we union schools? So both of those categories that I just spoke about, the teachers are unionized and so are the paraprofessionals. Some of them automatically, like at 5%, if, they, if they're there every year, they go up, up to like 
the 11th or 12th year, whatever, out there working, they get a 5% and a 5% automatically. So, and then on top of it, I thought last year we then gave them an additional increase for the wages. Is that so true or not true? Our, we have, a, uh, if I talk about the teachers first, teachers have a pay grid, a scale, right. and there are 12 steps in that, 10 at the bachelor's level, 12 at the master's. Uh, so there's 12 separate master's one and there's 10 separate There's steps. 10 steps. In a, with a bachelor's degree, right. you, you, you do have a step scale that you can move on every year of experience you advance on the scale. Right. And that step is worth not five, it's three and a quarter or 3.75%. Right. Uh, 3.75. Uh, the same is true for masters. Uh, you you advance on a track, um, and, and they there, have, there are 12, 12 steps, steps in there. There are 12 steps in theirs. Um, what was agreed to in this last negotiation, which is we're heading into the third, we're but we will be budgeting for the third. This year is the second of four years that we're in right now. The grid within the scale has actually moved half a percent. So. But if you four, start four. in the first year and you have a bunch of new teachers, I'm making this up by the way, because I realize some teachers have been around for a while, you've automatically had a built in three and a half percent right. in one of your examples only. Yes. Right. And then on top of that, do we then get an additional increase when you ask for something like last year? I didn't know this at all, by the way. So that so if you have already maxed out your scale and you've already been here the ten or twelve years and you advanced, yeah. they were awarded one point seven five percent. Right. And is that all they get? They don't have additional anything? They don't have additional. There are built into that collective bargaining agreement longevity payments <laughs> that they get for years of experience that are $1,400 additional after 15 years of service and $1,750 after 20 years of service. So I, I answered your question incorrectly. Yes, there is one, ad one additional. They also receive longevity. So. Um, when you have when you have reached that 12 year threshold you you now are only getting that 1.75 percent and but once you hit 15 you pick up another 1400 bucks <laughs> and you must keep track of how many people are under the 12 year and how many are other how, what's the percentage ballparkish only i'm not trying to be two, two thirds are two thirds are off the top of the grid or the bottom of the grid however you want to look at two it two thirds are here and have done the 10 or 12 the and beyond uh, a number just shy of that, closer to 50%, well, yeah, well, almost 60, I guess, now that I think about it, have reached at least the first longevity threshold to be receiving that extra $1,400. Do they have a doctorate level? We have an additional stipend for uh, CAGS, uh, Certificate of Advanced Graduate Studies, which is beyond the master's but short of a doctorate without the, without the dissertation, and then there's an additional stipend for the doctorate. The CAGS earns you another $1,900 and the doctorate earns you $2,100. Thank you. And that's when you get the book, uh, when you see in the, we can talk about when the budget books. Yeah, we, we can do it offline. There's, it's some, there's some data, that, that data is there so that you can go through and look at each each individual's track okay. and step and such. Thank you. Thank you. So that's 1819. Yeah. Uh, we'll be back in, uh, as snow begins to think about flying. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, we're not down the sixth grade wing, so the die is cast. Off we go. Uh, the <laughs> construction site has been established. Uh, we're gearing up for construction now. Design documents uh, yesterday were published to our uh, to our uh, repository of data. The design documents are at 80 percent, uh, and um, we have we have continued to work with an outstanding team that includes the folks from Trident, Project Advisors, uh, our Owners Project Management Group. Uh, Paul and Gino, uh, the architect and engineers uh, you may have seen uh, in our meetings from the H.L. Turner Group out of Concord, they're, uh, uh, they're doing the design and then the builders, uh, construction management firm is brought at Page and Stone out of Laconia. Um, all of them, I'm sure, have placed their placards on that fence. Uh, but uh, the process over the summer uh, has not been exactly what we wanted. We really saw that site come to complete uh, in the last couple of days. Uh, we, we ran into more asbestos than had been anticipated, and despite all of this testing that was done, uh, there, there must have been, in the years when they built that wing, uh, several drums of this black <laughs> mastic laying around that they just figured they would use because they found it even on the footings. Uh, it, was, it was in places that uh, nobody expected it and the testing hadn't revealed, so it slowed us down because there were some abatement steps that had to, had to be taken. Um, it certainly was, there was no enthusiasm, no excitement, the last, the last round of abatement when they had to 
chisel it off the, the concrete foundation, the foot frost is, wall. the frost wall, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and they said they would be doing so in, now I'm going to use the wrong word, but I call them hazmat suits. And I said, well, that's going to be great. We've got people driving by and we've got guys out there in these uniforms. That'll be, uh, walking on the moon. <laughs> walking on the moon. It wasn't, they, they weren't like that. They no. were like they wanted to keep their clothes clean. I mean, it was, it was a, you know, standard uh, regulatory, uh, reg, you know, regulated precautions. But uh, so that abatement is done. <clears throat> now that the site is nice and smooth, they will immediately begin to dig it back up again and we'll, uh, We'll start to work on footings, and uh, I will tell you that the building committee has been meeting and will continue to meet regularly. Their next meeting is tomorrow. Uh, that group will, will will help us as con construction starts and we start to really roll here uh, into the uh, into the fall and winter. The committee will help with communication so that there is more information uh, available. And then I just want to remind everyone, if you hadn't already heard. Um, that the June 2017, not 16, the 2000, June 17 bond sale was successful. Uh, we sold bonds uh, at a rate of 3.15%, which was great from the projections and all of the analysis that we'd done and the numbers we talked about. This is a, a, about $100,000 uh, $100, a year less in terms, of the, in terms of the payment. Mm. That was number. We were we were afraid that we might crest four percent and beyond on a twenty-five year bond. So three one five was uh, three one five was was uh, real exciting for us. So this is very exciting. Everybody is very excited about it. Um, we'll expect next week to see steel delivered on site. Uh, the concrete has been ordered and ready to come. The, uh, the we have three main issues going to happen, and that will be the, the steel, the concrete. And we also have our site development, which will, you know, get the site ready for all of those those things. So we expect that you'll start to see uh, some real movement on that site now with with uh, that mastic issue behind us. So it's We've moved. I said that in the course of this, but if you didn't know, you won't find us in the Marston space. We've moved to Seven Scott Road, down behind Hannaford. Um, you can get in anytime you want. Getting back out anytime after four o'clock. <laughs> Don't do it. No, it's that was the summertime. Yeah. yeah. Any questions? We got the piece of property on Tall Farm Road. What do you think you do with that? Well, we we um, we did some research um, and uh, dug through some old documents. Uh, the board clearly owns it, and the board clearly has uh, the right to do with it what they choose. Um, and board being the school board. School board, and the school board voted back um, the early in what September maybe. Um, they decided to just keep the land under the jurisdiction of the school board. Uh, recently, we had um, Mrs. Wolseley came and uh, wanted the. Um, land to be put into the Conservation Commission, um, the board took it under advisement. And so we are looking at um, that um, suggestion by Mrs. Wolseley uh, along with uh, Jay Diener who talked to us a little bit about uh, the property uh, having a uh, right of way. Um, Conservation easement. Conservation easement, was, yeah. which would um, make sure that the uh, land stayed as is. So that decision rests in the hands of our school board. What is the value of that land if you were to sell it? Well, we, we know there's about 30 acres. Um, 15 of those acres are buildable. We know that because the board, back in 2011, um, looked at that property as a potential site for the middle school should they walk away from the Hampton Academy site. Um, and uh, so we did, uh, we know that there's 15 acres of buildable property there that we could have put the building on. The value is whatever the value of an acre of land is in, in Hampton, and I don't know that. I don't know that. Well, now, since Mary Louise Wolseley put in a two cents to the school board, yeah. and it's contrary to my five cents, should I go to the school board and offer my five cents, or should I make it right now? Whichever makes you feel more comfortable. I think everyone would be happier if I said it right now. 
Last year, in the prior year, when we attempted to get the bond for this renovation project, I believe promises were made that steps would be taken to find other revenue sources to offset the cost as much as we could, which included the school board going after, I believe it was at the falls, trying yep. to get them to, to lease into it, as one of those other revenue sources. <laughs> This asset called 15 acres of usable land, total of 30 acres, is another resource for revenue. I believe that the promises made that we would find all other revenue sources still should apply. And you should, if you have no other use for it, you should in fact put it in private hands and get market value for it and use it to reduce the cost of the remodeling project as was promised to the voters. Now, I hope that was easier than me going to the school board to say. You take that under advisement. I appreciate that, Jenny. Okay. Thank you. Is that, is that a subtle denial? <laughs> no, it is not, Bob. It is not. We'll bring that back to the board. And just so you know, the board did make um, every effort uh, to talk with uh, neighboring school district relative to the students uh, joining the Hampton Academy. Family. Yes, I observed that. I and, believe that is true. And I think the school board should make every effort with other uh, idle assets and make them perform for the taxpayers, as, especially since it was basically promised. You would find all other alternative revenues to offset the cost of this remodeling project. That was part of the sales pitch. Mm -hmm. Let's let's be true to the, the vote. Well, and I think that over the past seven years, we have proven as a school board let's and our leadership. Let's continue that proof. Yes, let's continue that. that they will do that. Mm -hmm. so let's I'm continue sure. with that. I'm sure we'll take it under advice. I'm sure it will be a discussion. In future board meetings. I'll be happy to come to explain it any further if the school board so desires. Okay. Glad you didn't say ex superintendents because then I would have been bothered by that. No, that's all right. I, 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 are you finished with your presentation? We are finished. Okay. And any other questions from questions. this board? I just have from this com question. committee. Are you following the Portsmouth experiment about starting school later for the junior high kids? It's interesting you brought two years ago we did that with the community. We had family, uh, we had school board members, teachers uh, and, and parents involved in a discussion about uh, start times and, um, and uh, there was no uh, appetite uh, for changing the times. And so it's it's it stayed there. We're kind of watching Oyster River and Portsmouth. Both of them have changed uh, their times, it's particularly for the high school and the older kids. But it does affect middle school. They, uh, I've seen it on the news many times. But basically, the teenagers need more sleep, and they've shown that schools that start later and the kids later, they're more attentive, the right. grades are better, and they're more well behaved. It's a win-win-win all the way around if you could do it. So we will probably revisit that as we watch what happens at Oyster River and at uh, Portsmouth. When did Portsmouth start? Hey, when did Portsmouth start? This year. This year? This yeah. is the first year? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have one question for you, uh, Nathan. The, is it the MS-24 that you have to prepare for the revised revenue? Revenue 24, yes. 24. Have you done that yet? I have done. I have done it. I have not finished it and delivered it. No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, any other questions from anybody? Thank you Thank very you. much for Thank coming. You. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. They have set the bar. They have. Only the other departments. Can Only have the precinct will match. <laughs> <laughs> So now, moving on with our agenda, um, the next yes. item is the, Ginny, I didn't put the school board's um, update or review, only because I thought since this, Absolutely. they were here that you probably wouldn't need to go any further with it. 
Um, okay, so I didn't put you on here, but I have, um, Regina, do you have any updates or reports for us from the selectmen? Well, I do have, I did speak with the finance director yesterday, mm -hmm. and the selectmen are looking to probably get the budgets the end of this week in the final review of uh, town management right now. Mm -hmm. So other than that, unless anyone has any questions for me, I mean, I guess it's budget time again, so we're all waiting to get that. Okay. Sonny, I, yeah, I had a question. I noticed that the answer goes recommendation was Kathleen the email should be BCC blind copies to avoid nuisance suits and my impression of the right to know request that we served on the board was a nuisance suit because I was quoted in the Portsmouth papers as responding with an email saying gee it looks like it's going to be a fun year that's a, that's a public record. No, I said that. Huh? I said that. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I <laughs> Okay, so your question was, we, yes, yeah. we did well, give back. We, we did give a motion for a 4% raise because they said the town council right. was doing a great job. Well, yeah, because he provided a 17-page uh, uh, list, you know, the things he's been working on for the past year. Yeah, but you, were, you were present went to New Hampshire, met, Municipal Association said the only way to avoid RSA 91 nuisance suits is to do a blind copy. BCC. Yeah, I, I, I vaguely remember that. I think that was maybe uh, that a difference was, of opinion that was between. That solution to nuisance suits. Okay, but that's not the only, that's not the only uh, okay. task that Mark that's Gerald has been responsible so. for for the town, so we didn't base our the raise on that at all. You're all set, Sonny. Anybody else have anything for um, Selectman Barnes? Okay, moving right along. Um, the precinct update report. Please, Bob. Uh, I'll make it as riveting as possible. <laughs> <laughs> From a business point of view, the, the retail businesses were off this summer, as were the parking lots for both the precinct and the town and that is entirely driven by weather. If you lose fairly frequently one of the two weekend days, that's a, an impossible loss to make up. On the positive side, we have reached out to the flood victims on the side streets west of Ashworth Avenue and offered them places at the precinct lot, during, particularly during King Ties, because the, their vehicles have been threatened. They've even had some total losses of vehicles with floods on those streets on occasion. Uh, and we've had them speak at our meeting on a couple of occasions to kind of express their concerns in general about the issue. And finally, we tried a new event, which we put on last Saturday night with financial support from the chamber and the rec department of the town, which was a Boston uh, Circus Guild fire show on the beach, which was extremely well received. There were at least a couple of thousand people who came to watch it. And uh, it's on the Facebook website, Hampton Beach Door Odd, if any of you have any interest in observing it. It was a very professional, highly entertaining event. It, attracted lots of families and lots of children of an age where this was their first experience of this sort of an event at a, at a very high quality level. So well, that's about where we are right now. Thank you very much, Bob. Okay, number seven. Uh, uh, I oh, I'm sorry, go Bob. ahead, Sonny. Uh, I get it. We had a topless day at the beach. Were you a participant? No, but there was a, a severe shortage of male seniors, if you'd like to sign up. I <laughs> just <laughs> mm, Thank you, Sonny. Okay, moving right along now. Uh, monthly budget review and questions. 
Anybody have anything to ask or contribute regarding the monthly budget review that we get from Christy? Thank you very much. Moving right along, preparation of municipal budget committee budget. Um, I am working with Christina and I have a uh, preliminary uh, schedule worked out. I will have the, I will have it ready for our next meeting, okay? And that's all I have to talk about there. So thank you very much. I would like to um, approve the minutes from our March 21st meeting. I believe those are the only ones outstanding at the moment. Do I have a motion to approve I'll these minutes? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Okay, it's seconded by Sunny. Um, any changes? Anybody has? I have one change that needs to be done. On the first page, it says absent Regina Bond, selectman and representative. She was here, so that needs to be fixed. And along that same line, you might want to make a note, Barbara, that um, Stephen Henderson is excused from tonight's meeting. Okay. okay. Um, any any other changes? Anybody has? I just have a question about that process. Yes, sir. I thought I heard, and it could be the thing I went through the summer, that if you already have a letter, notes, day to day one, and then you make changes such as today for day two, you then have to create new notes for all of day two because you have to leave the historical day one there. Is that true? You're correct. Okay. So on the town website, the minutes have to be, the minutes from this meeting, for instance, we have five days. They have to be posted legally. Right. Uh, point of information, it's five business days. It's five days. It's not five business days. Yes, it's sir. five days. Okay. So I expect to have an outline of the minutes five days after this meeting. I have to have that. Okay. Now, that is a draft that's posted and is available to anybody that wants to examine them. Right. Now, the changes that we make tonight, this is the final. This is, you can see it's marked draft. No. It will become final. And that will be posted. So then but the draft to, never goes away. So you have the two. That, you That's have the exactly right. right. Good. Good. Okay. Thank you. To answer your question. Okay. Good. So um, we have a motion to uh, approve them. And it's by Brian. It's been seconded by Sonny. Any further questions? I'll ask for a vote. All those in favor? Jenny, were you I'm here staying, for that? Because I wasn't there. Okay, so we have everyone voted yes. Ginny abstained. I'll abstain too. I don't think I was there. I think you may not have been yeah, here. So there. Danielle will also abstain. And Jones abstains. Uh, and, and please note that Tim Jones left the room, so he didn't vote. All right. Now, other business. Um, I have, I got an email from, from one of the members um, that had, he had two issues that he thought we should talk about. Now, I already mentioned once before, but I'll mention it again. Um, I called this meeting to order. Please, um, all, please be recognized by the chair, okay, before you speak. Don't be speaking to each other across the room, okay, because that would be, that would be out of order. So please remember that. Um, would it be okay, okay David? At this point? Yes. When we were just being presented by the school, mm -hmm. it was okay for us to throw questions in like that, correct? I didn't have any correct? problem with that. Did anybody here have a problem with that? It I, seemed I think to, every, everybody seemed to have take a take a you know answer the ask a question, get an answer. Everything remained orderly, so I don't you know we don't need to micromanage this down to we're not children, we're adults, and so I think that the way it worked tonight worked very well. Now. Um, I will identify that David mentioned a couple of things. Last year and the year before, when as we went through the department head budgets, for some reason, I'm not sure what it was, it was decided that <coughs> the we wouldn't actually make any changes to the budget, that somehow we would wait until the, there would be a final review. Okay, I would prefer that as we go through the budget, 
and the people are here. Now, I'll make sure that you have your agenda ahead of time so you'll know who's going to be here to talk. Look through your budget book. It's the same, pretty much the same format. Every year that everybody here has seen several times, David, you're the only one that's only been through the process once, um, but it's not brand new every year. So look through the book, prepare questions, have things ready. You want to make a change, make a change. Make a motion, we'll make a change. As far as waiting until making no changes to the budget at all, and then having it all on one night at the end, when a lot of these people weren't here, I would prefer not to do that. And the email that I got, I'm going to read to you what it says. We voted on all articles at most, at almost all meetings in the fall, yet the vote meant nothing because they were not final votes. And then a final vote at the end of December, early January. Review the articles early on is a must. Voting on them was a joke and a total waste of time. I don't want to waste anybody's time. And, and I don't, I don't want to, I don't want anybody to think it's a joke, neither. So I would suggest that that's the format that we, that we follow. That if you want to make a change during the budget process, question the people that are here. We interview them. If there's something that needs to be made, changed, make a motion. If it gets a second and it passes, fine. If it doesn't, fine. I'm not saying that at the end, for instance, um, with gas, there were some things, some variables that we didn't know until the end. But we don't need to wait until the final to make all the changes. Okay. The second thing that this email, I'll just read to you what it says. We need to control people ponti pontificating about their personal points for up to 15 minutes. We need to agree on reasonable time limits and then enforce them. Actually, last year's chairman was one of the biggest offenders. <laughs> I don't know if I should be reading that part. Um, you know, let's, again, we're all adults here, okay? Let's just keep things reasonable. David had mentioned to me something about when he was working in corporate, they used to use uh, timers. This is a happens to be a three-minute one. He brought a couple of them in. Um, you know, if if we if I put these little things here, it's I'm not saying I'm not going to do what was done at the select board a few years ago. That take out these three-minute timers and say, okay, you're finished. You know, you're done talking. We don't. I don't think we need to go there. I don't think that that's what we need to do. We're all adults here. I think that uh, I think we should be able to keep this, um, keep it friendly, keep it respectful for one another, and perhaps, um, perhaps even make this a little bit of fun. There's no reason why we can't enjoy ourselves here and go through the budget and make this process, you know, is, is, uh, do our job. Do a job. Just go through the budget, come up with a budget, and present it to the people in town to vote. So that's that's what I had to say on that. Does anybody have any other new, old, any business at all that they would like to discuss tonight? I'm not clear on what you said regarding uh, the votes being taken in the fall. Um, we vote online in the fall. Does that mean we cannot revisit it until public hearing? No, it doesn't mean that. Okay. So regardless of how you vote in the fall on a line item, you can request a reconsideration vote prior to the public hearing. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. But, but, but as we go through the process, prepare yourself. When the people are here, ask them questions. Because last and if you want to make a change, bring make a you know make a motion right then and there. You don't need to wait until afterwards because it seems to me that if I remember correctly, and I might be wrong, um, that the format was we're not you know we're not making any changes until this final review thing. It's not necessary. Right, that was to save time. I know it was. But at the same, I'm glad you mentioned saving time because um, I think that if we, if you have something to say, make the point, say it. 
Want to make a motion? Make a motion. So, David. We just confused two different topics on that question. What I had, should we discuss it? Yes. Should we discuss it and, and make points like you said? Absolutely yes. But what I said, no voting on it. Because we'd go around the table, which I said was a total waste of time, voting in the fall because it meant nothing. And the January, that's when it counts. That's the final vote. It makes, I don't think no, I heard that when Tim started okay. talking. Can, okay. I, can I explain? No, let me explain for a minute, okay, just to make sure that I understand what David's even talking about. What I'm talking about is that, for instance, if we have the police department in here, if you want to make a change to their budget, you can do it while they're here. Yes. Make a change. I'm with that 100%. Okay, that's, that's what I'm talking about. That's point eight. We don't need to say nobody can make any changes until the very end. Correct. That isn't necessary. You can make a change, and of course, there is always the opportunity to revisit something. Correct. Okay, that's why we're here. Okay, so, Mr. Jones, you wanted to uh, add something to that? No, I think it's just important, Dave, to keep in mind that uh, we won't be necessarily voting on every line item in January unless someone wants to reconsider a particular line item. That's what I'm understanding, correct? I think that's correct. Right. So the vote we take in the fall could be a final vote. I'm or just, it might not be, depending on... I'm just on suggesting that we don't take a fall vote. That was very clearly stated in my memo, so I thought. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm against voting in the fall because it was a waste of time, was my statement. Actually, is it the purpose of a public meeting to have the public input into the budget? And to move it to the public hearing. That's, that's, that's another, we're that's talking about that's that's another process. That's See, another you, kind of process. I even back to the way it used to be long ago where you went over every department's budget, you made the changes that you wanted to, mm -hmm. and then it moved to final it moved to final review. No, 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 no. We're, in we're having the opportunity prior to the public hearing yes, every, to vote, no, to reconsider a line item that we previously voted on. That's the difference. So you got every meeting you're going to review? No. no. If, so, if, if someone wants to reconsider a line item in January before we take it to the public hearing. Right, at the final review. Before we take it to the right. public hearing. Right, right. Then we can't. According to what I understand from right, but what I'm what I am saying is that that's something we, that didn't exist last or the previous years. As we go through the process with the people here, we interview them. If you want to make a change, make a motion, and we'll change it right then and there. Some particular part of it. We don't need to wait until the final review to make any changes at all. What I'm saying is, you can make the changes because that way, for instance, if you decide, um, I remember two years ago, and I'm going to be very brief with this. Um, at the final review, Jerry Zanoy at the time made a motion to uh, cut $50,000, or no, it cut $25,000 out of a $55,000 line, okay? It was the overtime line in the fire department. The fire chief wasn't here to explain, well, if you do that, this is what's going to happen. So all I'm saying is that if you have cuts you want to make like that, do it while the people are here so they can at least say, well, if you do that, it's going to affect this. That's all I'm saying, please. When I understand the process that I'm hearing, I like it better than any that I've been here with before. My first year we were here, we couldn't reconsider any line items. In January, we only had a vote on the grand total period. End of story, get out of here. Right? And that was the first two years. Um, then we moved to this, this other thing where, well, let's have a, let's have a vote in, final vote on every line item in January prior to the public hearing. <coughs> but at the same time during the fall, uh, not to allow any amendments at that time, which caused a backlog of Jerry Zanoy having adjustments to make in January, which wasn't good either. This is kind of a hybrid of those two extremes, so to speak, which I think makes sense. We can make motions on the spot. We're still reserving the right to change it in, in, at any time prior to the public hearing, regardless of how we might have voted originally. I think that makes sense. Okay. Does everybody understand? Okay. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, as Jenny said, this is the way we used to do it. Okay, right. good. And it worked out great. Okay, then then we're gonna then we're gonna make sure that we do it that way. So thank you very much, uh, Sonny. You had something to ask? Yeah. No, I was gonna or point out that the reason for the last year was we a uh, few of the meetings we didn't have the budget material in time, so think 
Things well, were cut out of hand with the yeah, board of selectors. Okay, well, uh, that was last year. Then, then, yeah, we're, gonna, then we're gonna deal with this year. Yeah. So let's let's just deal with this year. So, we're just going to get exactly. So I don't any, let this go because it's not answered. What, David? It, and my point was, what I was saying in that, last year after somebody presented something, Mary Louise, the chairperson, would say, okay, let's take a vote on what we just did in the fall. And go around the table, we have eight to zero, whatever the numbers are, nine zero in seven years, and no. And I'm saying that whole process there was a waste of time because that voting meant nothing. It had nothing to do with what you talk about. We should discuss the article, we should have agreements with it, we should discuss it with it. But we took a vote to pass it or not, the article itself, whatever it was, when the fire chief was here. Then in the January, we voted again finally. I'm saying that process we went through every night voting was a waste of time. Right, we well, should be discussing the article. Okay, okay. It was, but this year the vote will have meaning, right. because unless someone moves to change, so you're the saying paper, keep voting, yes or no? Because that vote will now have meaning. Mary yes. Louise got hung up on the fact that in order to discuss anything, you had to move the, you had to move an item onto the agenda. You couldn't discuss, you know, whether the sky was blue or not, unless you got a motion in a second. Okay, now just just so that. I would like to aim that our meetings would also still, let's aim for 10 o'clock, okay? If we aim for 11, then we end up at 11.30. Let's aim for 10 o'clock to finish. So keep an eye on the clock, and let's keep moving things along. Now, when it comes to, for instance, hold on, when it comes to the police department's budget, and we go through depart uh, line by line and section by section, we don't need a vote on each section. When we get to the bottom, for instance, line of the of the police department, we can take a vote. Okay. Now, mind you, that doesn't mean that you don't have the ability to. Mister. Yes, sir. Line. I want to be clear on this because we debated this about all the time. That doesn't mean any line on the paper. You're talking about a line item as it gets put into the official budget. Correct. Which the entire thing, as you know, is is. It's broken down to do, you know, what, a, a dozen lines at most? Exactly. exactly. And, and so we but should only be taking a dozen votes, not exactly. three dozen votes, that's including it. subtotals and all that. No, that's stories. what I'm talking about, Tim. Yeah. Okay. I want to get clear on that. And when you say line, you mean true line, not subline. Yeah, it's a, that's not exactly subtotals. what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking yeah. about, okay? So, and I think the rest of us, you know, I think the rest of you pretty much know. And if you don't, as we start the budget process and get the books, We'll just, you know, go through it again if we have to explain it again a little bit. But it's it's not as difficult. It's actually going to be, we're going to make this simple, okay? And it will move right along, okay? So, Sonny? Shouldn't we have it written down? Have what written down? We didn't have a process. Last year, Tim, for example, said no. We don't have, um, well, we have a Well, we have a video, and it will be in the minutes. It will be reflected in the minutes. So as far as having a, a book of rules written down, no. No, I don't think that's necessary. Okay. I make a motion in a quarter and nine to adjourn. I will. Do I have a second on that? Second. Seconded by Brian. We actually discussed everything on the agenda. Yes, we finished. No. Brian. I we have one more item I want to bring up. Oh. Okay, hold on. Which is exactly point. about voting for leaving. Last year we said we were told a number of times we didn't get this from the select and we didn't get that. We're behind. We have to rush through. Nobody can talk. We have to get through. And we get out of here at 9.30. Why were we rushing? We got out a lot last year at 9.30, quarter 10. I can only remember once, maybe twice, but we stayed till 10. We were, we were getting out at 9.15, 9.30. We had plenty of time to discuss things, but yet the chair kept telling us, well, we can't do this, we can't do that. We were, I thought we had plenty of time for everybody to say what they had to say, and we always made 10 o'clock. Yeah. That was last year. This is right. That's okay. That's okay. And I hope that I didn't put any pressure on anybody tonight um, and I no, you didn't it was okay. great and here we are where we are so um, again okay are you finished David yes sir thank you I have Sonny, a question. go ahead uh, are we getting the Excel spreadsheet file as we have in prior years I would imagine so would I don't you please see any reason just ask why not Christy, I will yeah that's no reason why we can't because you can have it in, in that format as you well know um, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I hope everybody during the summer read this wonderful book, picked up their copy. There was one available for every person here. If you read this book, you're going to know an awful lot, not just about budgeting, but about the whole process for the town and the state. So, thank you.
thank you, Tim, for mentioning that. Anything else? Yes. Um, did we receive any other communication other than Dave's uh, email? No. Because I, I saw, uh, was it April or May, uh, there was a request for uh, an appointment. Yes. Yes. And, and I haven't seen anything subsequent to that. I had a conversation on the telephone and that uh, person uh, decided not. Just a question. I'm sorry. I didn't get who you said. She, he, did, he didn't say. He didn't <laughs> say. Okay. And we're not going to. Person X. Okay. Anything else, Tim? Um, no. We have a motion to adjourn. Seconded. All those in favor? Who's the second, please? Fine. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that was unanimous. Thank you very much. We're adjourned. Thank you, Channel 22.